Greetings and welcome back. In this fourth mini lecture on Congress, I want to talk a bit about Congress and the Constitution. Keep in mind that Congress is a bicameral chamber, that this was at the heart of the Great Compromise, remember, at the Constitutional Convention. You had large states that wanted a government that they could control or that they could dominate. Uh, small states were terrified uh, of a government that might control them. And, and as a result, essentially each side was given a chamber to dominate. So the large states were given the House of Representatives. Uh, the House of Representatives is a larger chamber there are 435 members. It is much more formal in operation, which gives the leadership, which is headed by the Speaker. Currently, the Speaker of the House is a Democrat from San Francisco, at least the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Nancy Pelosi. So we have a female Speaker. She is the only woman who has ever served as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, representative, uh, the large states, uh, California is the largest state, has the most people, has 53 House members. Uh, the smallest state in terms of population is Wyoming. They only have one. The Senate, on the other hand, is dominated by the smaller states. The Senate is a much smaller chamber than the House of Representatives with only 100 members. Uh, it is more informal in operation, and I'll talk a lot about that uh, as we go on. Uh, and the leadership has less power. Uh, if I were to ask you on the exam, who is the most powerful member of the Senate? Uh, the answer would be the majority leader. That is currently uh, Mitch McConnell. But keep in mind that the majority leader is not as powerful as the speaker. The speaker has far more power over the legislative process in the House than the majority leader is in the Senate. Uh, although I will say that Mitch McConnell, uh, whether you like him or whether you don't like him, uh, is a very, very good tactician. He does his job very, very well. If you scroll down to representation, I want to add something here uh, from your book. I think your book does an excellent job. Uh, I had never heard this phrase until I read uh, the textbook, and so uh, I don't have it in the notes. You may want to add it. Uh, um, it's something you, you might see on the exam. Uh, if you want to go to your textbook and look at it, it's this concept called descriptive representation. Uh, it's on page 301 in your textbook. And descriptive representation is this concept of to what degree is the composition of a representative body, in this case it would be Congress. So to what degree does Congress reflect the demographic composition of the body as a whole. In other words, to what degree do your representative bodies look like the people that they represent? And of course, your book's premise in this section is that Congress is not very representative of American society as a whole. Uh, I'll go over some of the statistics uh, from your textbook uh, in just a minute. Uh, but the point is, is that if you look at virtually any indicator, uh, Congress is, is not very representative. Uh, the majority of Americans are female, uh, and yet less than a quarter of our congresspersons uh, are female. Uh, if you take a look at the white population, uh, it is overrepresented in both houses of Congress. Um, Hispanics uh, and Asians are underrepresented. Uh, Congress certainly, and your book doesn't talk about this, but Congress is much older than American society as a whole. Uh, your book does mention that Congress is a lot more affluent. There's uh, tremendous wealth. Uh, the vast majority uh, of people in Congress, especially in the U.S. Senate, uh, are very wealthy individuals. 
Uh, and so unlike a lot of parliamentary democracies in Europe where you see a significant number of civil servants, where you see a significant number even of blue collar workers uh, being in representative assemblies, uh, not nearly as true in our particular country. So let's take a look at senators. Uh, senators represent uh, a whole state. So uh, every state has two senators. Uh, both of our senators, ironically, uh, are female, even though only 23 uh, senators in America are female. Two of them come from California. Uh, remember that uh, the Senate uh, representation is based on geography. So if you are a state, you get two senators. Whether you are a large state, a small state, whether you have a lot of people or not very many. Uh, the Senate is often called the small state chamber or the upper house. The Senate does have some unique powers that I did not list. Uh, but as I'm lecturing, just coming to mind, uh, but some unique powers of the Senate include confirming federal judges, which I talked about at length uh, when I talked about the Supreme Court. Uh, obviously, uh, the Senate tries impeachment cases, and they have the power with a two-thirds vote. They can remove a president from office. Uh, senators uh, give advice and consent. Uh, on treaties, for example. I want to go back to this notion of the Senate being uh, the small state chamber or the upper house. Your book points out that California, New York, and Texas have about a quarter of the nation's population. Uh, and yet, despite having about 25% of the nation's people, they only have six senators representing them. I mentioned earlier that a majority of Americans live in the nine most populated states, and yet a majority of Americans are only represented by 18 senators. A minority of Americans are represented by 82 senators. So as I told you earlier, uh, I find it intriguing that there is so much disdain uh, for the Electoral College, but actually the U.S. Senate is a far less democratic institution. Now, for supporters of the Electoral College and for supporters of the Senate, what they are going to tell you is that that's why there was a compromise, that in our country we do not just represent people, we also represent geographical entities. So in America, representation is a hybrid. It has two parents. We represent our people and we represent our states. And so in the House of Representatives, the larger states are dominant. In the Senate, the smaller states are dominant. And remember the idea of the compromise was in order to get anything done, the large states and the small states would have to agree. So if we move to the House of Representatives, uh, House members represent uh, a district. Uh, in the case of states that don't have a lot of people, like Wyoming, for example, that district could be the whole state. Just as the Senate has some unique powers, so too does the House of Representatives, and I don't have this in the notes, but if you want to write them down, you can. Uh, a couple of unique powers of the House of Representatives uh, include uh, originating uh, revenue bills, uh, so-called money bills. Uh, remember, it is the House of Representatives that brings impeachment charges against the president. Uh, the House of Representatives brought impeachment charges uh, against President Trump and forwarded them to the Senate who uh, acquitted him. Uh, the leader of the House, as I mentioned earlier, is the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House is constitutionally mentioned. Uh, the Speaker is second in line to the presidency behind uh, the Vice President. 
Uh, the Speaker has tremendous powers over the legislative process, and I'll talk about the Rules Committee later on. Uh, currently, representation varies in the House of Representatives uh, from one member, Wyoming, to 53 members in the state of California. Keep in mind that population is a moving target. Every day people are born, people die, people move from one state to another, people move within a state from one part of the state to the other. Uh, and so because population is dynamic and is evolving and changing um, every day multiple times, there is a census every 10 years. And I will ask you, how often is there a census? Uh, a census takes place uh, uh, every 10 years. Uh, after the census, uh, house seats are reapportioned uh, every 10 years. Uh, and your book points out uh, that population shifts in recent decades, and by recent decades, this has been the last five or six decades, or maybe even seven decades, where population shifts have meant more political power for states that are in the South and in the West. So political power has been shifting from the East to the West, from the North to the South, from what we used to call the old industrial rust belt, uh, to the Sun Belt, uh, and this is a trend uh, that has been going on uh, for quite some time. Uh, in the last three census in 1990, 2000, and 2010, the three states that have gained the most representatives uh, are California, Texas, and Florida, although if you take a look at your textbook, which only shows the 2010 uh, census results, California did not gain any representation uh, in 2010 uh, at all. So it was uh, Texas and Florida that were the big winners. In, in the last two and a half minutes, I just want to expand uh, on a concept I mentioned earlier, and that is how Congress is not very representative of the people they represent. Uh, women are over 50% uh, of America's population and yet women are only represented 23% in the House and the Senate, and at least a couple of years ago, that ranked the United States 72nd in the world in terms of gender representation. So in terms of industrial democratic societies in the world, we certainly do not look very good. Uh, your book does point out that uh, black representatives in the House of Representatives are about at par uh, in terms of representation, uh, but very underrepresented in the Senate. Uh, for Hispanics, 18% of the general population is Hispanic, but only 11% of the House, 5% of the Senate are. And if you look at uh, uh, Asian Americans, about 6%. Uh, of America's uh, population is Asian, uh, and yet only 3% of House members and 3% of Senators are Asian. So uh, women are underrepresented, non-whites are underrepresented. Uh, if you take a look at the occupations uh, of uh, the Congress, uh, there are uh, a lot of lawyers, uh, increasingly more business people, and many would say, unfortunately, career politicians. The most intriguing uh, statistic that I found uh, about demographics in your chapter uh, was the fact that in 2017, about 25% uh, of all House members were former congressional staffers. And so very, very intriguing that you have a lot of congressional staffers that work for a congressperson. And, and then when that congressperson typically retires, that staffer runs for their seat. I know many years ago we had a situation where our uh, congressperson, uh, uh, at least at that time, uh, Gary Condit, uh, was actually his former congressional staffer, Dennis Cardoza, uh, ran against him in that election. Uh, and happened to defeat him. 
Uh, next time I'll talk about tenure and requirements for Congress.